So the, for the past four weeks, we've been learning about hope and what good timing we need and when do we not need hope. Four weeks of talking about hope. Week one, uh, I talked about defining hope. What is hope? How is hope different from faith? I talked about how hope is the joyous anticipation of good. It's expecting that God is going to do something good. Hope is the fuel for our faith. If faith is the car and we have to get into the car and we have to start the car and we have to drive the car to get the car moving, that's faith. Well, hope is the fuel in the gas tank. Hope is the thing that propels us down the road. And you're not gonna get very far with your faith if you start to lose hope. And even though these two things overlap at times, hope is its very own thing and it stands alone as one of the three things that will remain as a marker of a person of God. And we also talked about how hope is an anchor for our souls. It is something to hold on to no matter what in any time that holds us steady. In the second week of the series, Ian shared with us a story of hope from his own life. How you can have hope even in the midst of a tragedy. I really wanna encourage you to go back and listen to that if you missed it. Because out of a lot of pain and out of a lot of struggle, Ian was able to even connect the dots to the story in 2 Kings chapter four a story of hope. He encouraged us that hope is found when you take your pain back to the promise. In week three, Ian shared with us that from the verse where it says, Christ is in me, the hope of glory. We can know that because of the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is. We can be confident that because of what Jesus has done, we have hope. We have a new identity in Christ. We are part of the family of God. We can have hope. And then Jonathan shared, if you missed that, that was just this last week, please go back and listen. Um, Incredible message about how hope overcomes fear. You know, if fear is the anticipation of something bad happening, Well, hope is the opposite. Hope is the anticipation of something good. And God overcame fear in Jonathan's life. Jonathan shared with us how his journey, how Jesus set him free and how we can live filled with hope. Filled with hope to excess and overflowing, super abounding hope. Not just hope for us, but hope for the people around us. So let me review all this. I'm just gonna say it and you guys just take it in. This is what we're talking about this morning. Hope, the joyous anticipation of good, the fuel of our faith, the anchor of our souls, our strength in the midst of tragedy, Christ in me, the hope of glory, a life abounding with hope that overwhelms our fears, overcomes our struggles and overflows to those around us. When tragedy strikes, when nothing makes sense, when everything is upside down, that's when we have to grab on hold of hope. It's something solid that you can hold on to this morning. So if your heart's heavy, if you're feeling overcome, if you're feeling overwhelmed or exhausted, then this message is for you this morning. Because there is hope for the weary and the heavy hearted today, amen? There's hope for every person in this room and it doesn't matter what you're carrying. It's not too heavy for Jesus. Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Let me sharing with you, starting in verse one. Now, Jesus had been uh, sending out his disciples um, 
It's amazing that we get to cooperate with God, that he has people as part of his plan. He could, he could have done it on his own and he includes us. And um, that's the context, that's where we are. And, um, you know, John had been thrown into prison, uh, wrongfully accused John the Baptist. And he's in prison and awaiting probable death or just staying in prison forever. Because there's really no way to get out because he has offended the powers that are in charge by telling the truth. So in the context of that, this is what, where we come to chapter 11, verse one. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? What? This is one of those head shaking passages in scripture that should just make you go, what? This is John the Baptist who said, who was sent as a prophet from God to prepare the way for Jesus to come. This is the same John who pointed at Jesus and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the same John the Baptist who looked at Jesus and saw the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove, marking him and saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is John the Baptist who wore uncomfortable clothes, was a wild man, lived out in the desert and was constantly talking to the religious authorities of the time with boldness and calling everyone to repentance. You can't pick a more brave, strong, bold man. This is a man's man, John the Baptist. And here he is in prison in a very dark moment. And of course, he's human. Of course he is. He's having some doubt. He's having some fear. He's losing his hope that Jesus is the Messiah. Because they, everyone expected that Jesus would come and do what they wanted. I mean, that's not new. We all expect Jesus to come and do what we wanted, right? That's, they thought that he was gonna come and he was gonna come with military power and that he was going to gather up and destroy the enemies of Israel and that there would be a victory right then. And so everyone's like, here is the, not just the Messiah, but here is the judge. Here is the high priest. Here is the king. Get everybody bow down. It's time for the reign of God. And Jesus wasn't doing it the way that anyone expected. He was healing people. He was touching people. He was listening to people. He was sending people out to talk about good news, about the kingdom. Nothing was going how he expected. Verse four, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So why are they offended? They're offended because he's not doing what they expected. I thought you were gonna do this and you're doing this. Jesus had a way that was better and that was for all nations. It was so big that they couldn't understand it all at once. It was being revealed slowly over time through Jesus as he taught. See, things don't always go how we expect. Verse seven, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? That's like, did you go out to see a wimpy person that's easily influenced, right? 
What did you go out and see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So John is strong. See, Jesus doesn't correct John here. John's feeling doubt, he's feeling hopeless. He's also saying that Jesus is the Messiah, right? And Jesus doesn't say, hey, stop doubting. Or, hey, cheer up. You notice what he does? He tells him what he's doing. See, Jesus can't speak to what we expect him to do. He can only tell you what he's doing. See, Jesus isn't gonna come and say, let me explain why I'm not doing things the way that you think things should be done. He's gonna say, hey, pay attention, look what I'm doing and join me in what I'm up to. So it's a gentle, kind correction. It's also letting him know through prophecy that he really is the Messiah. He's like, I'm doing what the prophecies say. These are, these are quotes of things that they knew by heart. So it's a way of letting John know, hey, I really am the Messiah. It's not how you expect. Look at what I'm doing. And then he reminds John who he is. And he reminds everybody else who he is. This is a man that is strong. And then he throws at the end, every single one of us that believe in Jesus that are in his kingdom are greater than he is. He lifts John up and then he lifts us up even higher. You see what he did there? What is he saying about the kingdom of God? See, John needed a message of hope and Jesus gave him a message of hope. He was feeling hopeless. He was running low on hope. He was feeling tired and weary. He went on to say in verse 25, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Don't skip over that first line, Lord of heaven and earth. That's just Jesus letting us know that I am king up there and down here, right? God is not somewhere else far away ruling things from a distance. He is for sure ruling in heaven, but he is also down here with us, Emmanuel, like Jonathan sang, God with us. He's down here, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. You see that? And I love that he hides these things from the learned and the wise. You know, if you look at that word, um, in the Greek, you know what it looks like? The put together. I love that the message of hope that I'm gonna preach today isn't for people who have it all together. It's just gonna go right over your head because you don't need it. It's interesting that Jesus points that out, isn't it? Jesus is saying that some things I have to say are so good that you have to be like a little baby to get it. You know, because kids get this. Kids understand how to get a hold of things that they want. They'll let you know, see? They'll let you know. They'll say, they'll say give, me, give me what I need right now, right? That's, that's what it's like in the kingdom. See, we have to become like little children. He doesn't want us to become less mature, right? He wants us to become more dependent. 
See, Jesus is saying you have to become like a child in the sense that you know, you're not gonna get a hold of what I have to say today because I'm only gonna teach two verses. And we're gonna go over them and over them and over them, two verses. And they're so powerful and they're so good that you can't get a hold of them unless you're bankrupt. You can't hold on to them unless you're hopeless, unless you're burdened, unless some part of your life is weary, you don't need the message that I'm gonna preach. And so it goes right through your fingers. He's telling them that. In verse 20 through 24, Jesus actually warns the cities where he preached that didn't repent. He goes through some warnings that are hair-raising warnings, but we're gonna, we're gonna skip over that and go down to verse 28. And I wanna slowly walk through two verses to have the ability to set us free if we will just get a hold of it. They're so powerful, they can set us free if we will just get a hold of them. So we're gonna slow down and we're gonna walk through this verse. So just go ahead and take a breath for a second. You know, and there's a million things on your mind, but just, let's just read this verse together. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Those first three words are pretty important. Come to me. You know, when people are going through a tragedy in their lives, there's a they don't need a lot of words. It's not helpful, you can't even hear them anyways when you're in, going through something horribly painful and difficult. They don't need a lot of words. They do need a person that will be with them and walk through it. And that might be you and it might not, right? I don't want everybody to walk through a tragedy with me. There's a few people on my list that are invited in, right? And Jesus is one of them. On my list, when I am in a tragedy, he says, come to me. See, Jesus isn't inviting us here to some principle or a program that will help us get through or a formula that works when you do it. He's inviting us to him. He says, come to me. Why are we talking about this verse today? The reason why we're talking about this verse is because real hope is found in only one place and that is the person of Jesus Christ. Real hope's found in Jesus. He goes on to say, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. You know, we all have a burden that we're carrying. Your life is a burden, it's been given to you, it's a weight. You have to carry it whether you want to or not. If you lay in bed and don't do anything all day, that burden's still on you. It doesn't matter if you don't do anything. It doesn't matter if you won't pull the weight. It's still there. So when Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, that's everyone in this room. It's not just those who are brokenhearted. It's everyone, if you're really honest about your life, you know you're not gonna be able to do this on your own. It's just not gonna work if you try to pull your own load by yourself. You know, everybody's different and not everyone always recognizes that they're burdened. You know, I yesterday after a week of like a lot of heavy things and, and knowing I'm gonna preach and rewriting the sermon three times and um, finally settling down and cleaning the house and getting lunch made and 
you know, then you clean up and then everybody goes away to their, their rooms to do the things and it's quiet finally for 15 minutes. You know, those rare 15 minutes of quiet? That's when you find out where your burden is. That's why silence and, and solitude are so important for our walk with Jesus because you can just be so busy you don't even notice. But I felt it immediately when everything finally stopped, just a wait. You ever feel that? Do you ever get quiet long enough to feel the weight of your life? What you're doing right and what you're doing wrong carries weight, not just for you, but your children and your friends and everyone around you. Everything that you do is having an impact in this world and you are carrying that burden. And that burden can be really heavy. And you might not even notice it until you stop for a second and you take a breath and you say, okay, yep, you're right. I've got a weight here that I can't carry by myself. And Lord, you're gonna have to help me. Have you guys ever been so tired that a vacation sounds exhausting? <laughs> I love that line, I will give you rest. You see that in verse 28, I will give you rest. Man, Cassie was talking to me the other day about going camping. She's like, we should go camping. And I was like, that sounds horrible. <laughs> I mean, Maybe if someone took everything there and set it all up, right? <laughs> Hooked an air conditioner up to the side of the tent. Maybe, but have you ever just been so tired? You know, I, I, I've been weary, I've been tired, you know. I, sometimes you don't even know why, you know. Sometimes you're feeling just like, man, things just feel heavy. And sometimes, you know, you know, you know, it's like, okay, I know exactly what's going on here. But man, I've been feeling tired. And when you feel really that kind of heavy, tired, there's no vacation that will even touch it. And uh, there's a certain kind of rest that you can only have from Jesus. It's a gift. And what's great about that is that you don't have to go on vacation to get it. You know, you don't have to plan some elaborate rest to get a hold of the rest that comes from God. You can actually come to me, Jesus says, right? If you're heavy and weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. See, real rest is a gift from God. You know, and I, I don't have time to unpack Hebrews chapter four, but it talks about the promise of entering his rest. It still stands for the people of God. That's us. That is a Sabbath rest for your soul. What's unique about a Sabbath rest is that, and then the writer of Hebrews actually explains this in detail in, in chapter four, but he, he, what he's explaining is it's not the kind of rest like when you work really hard and then you go to sleep because you're tired, that kind of rest. That kind of rest feels good, you know, when you're tired and you sleep. This is a different kind of rest. God was not tired when he created the world. You know that? On the seventh day when he rested, that was not a rest of tired weariness. That was a rest of satisfaction, of wholeness, of completion. Yes, it's when you know that you did something right and good and perfect. And it has that feeling of yes. We have that going on in our lives. That kind of Sabbath rest is available for the people of God that we can actually grab hold of and keep. No matter what's going on, no matter what's coming at us, we can have a Sabbath rest that we have, even if we feel tired in our bodies, we can feel rested in our souls, holding on to that anchor that we talked about. That's what it feels like. So how do you get a hold of that kind of hope? You know, because I need that kind of rest for my soul and I think everybody in here could use a little rest 
for their souls. So Jesus actually explains to us how to do it. And it's just so simple, it's too hard to grab a hold of. But what, what does he say? Verse 29, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So what's a yoke? A yoke is a bar or a frame that's attached to the heads or necks of two work animals, like oxen. So they can pull a plow or a heavy load. A yoke was designed to limit the animal's movements to moving in the same direction and dispersing the load between them if there were multiple animals pulling the load. So it's this idea that Jesus is saying, he says, take my yoke upon you. Because, and that's a way of going over two animals. So basically you have two oxen and a lot of times, uh, in fact, they still train um, oxen the same way. If you go to an Amish community and you see how they're going to basically plow their field, they're gonna have two oxen and what they do to train their oxen, I watched a training video on YouTube on this. It was pretty interesting. How, how do you train an oxen? Well, you put a yoke on them and you have an experienced ox that knows what it's doing. And this is the old, wise, strong ox. And then you take a dumb, young, stupid ox <laughs> and you put them next to him. And what you do is you put a yoke over the top of both of their shoulders. And what happens is through a process, the young ox learns not to go too far ahead or it hurts, right? Or to lag too far behind or it hurts. Eventually, they learn that when they are in step, when they are in sync, when they are walking with the more experienced ox, the load is distributed between the both of them and immediately the load becomes light and everything just glides. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus is saying that you can come up alongside of him and he's gonna carry some of your weight. You have a load that you're carrying and he's saying, I don't want you to carry that on your own. You know, but what does that practically look like? I mean, when we think about being yoked up to Jesus, it's hard to imagine what that would be like. So I just wanna talk for a minute about what it looks like to pull ahead of Jesus and what it looks like to lag behind with Jesus. I mean, do you ever feel like God doesn't really care? So you're gonna have to do something. I gotta take this. God, you're not showing up fast enough, so I gotta make this happen. That's what it, one of the ways you'll know that you're pulling ahead of Jesus. Do you ever take action before you think or pray? That might be a good example that you are running ahead of the directions of your master and king and pulling ahead with the yoke. That's why it hurts. That's why it's heavy. That's why it's exhausting. Do you ever impulsively take things into your own hands and try to make something happen for you or for somebody else? Well, it's exhausting, isn't it? You know, this message isn't for lost people. This message is for found people. This message is for people who want a king and a Lord and a teacher to come up alongside of them and help pull the weight. What does it look like to lag behind? Sometimes you wanna stop, you wanna slow down, or you wanna give up. You wanna pretend like the life that you have, the life you've been given, isn't really yours to bear. And so maybe you try to get other people to pull it for you. Or you try to just drag your feet in making decisions that you already know that God is leading you to do. You know, when I've, uh, I had a brief stint as a, as a counselor when I did private practice, and that, I, I did that for about six months, and I was like, I'm going into the ministry, you know? And it was, it was very difficult, but people would come in, and I, I thought for sure they were coming in to get advised on kind of what to do, that they wanted guidance. 
But you know what? That people can come for help and not want any guidance at all. Did you know that? It's like they wanted me to pull the load and I, can't, I can barely pull mine. You know, I'm not, I'm not just trying to make you feel good. It is a miracle that I am standing here. I am just barely pulling my weight. I'm sorry, I actually can't pull any of your weight. I'm not strong enough. God can help you, right? He can pull, but I, I can't pull. That's what it looks like. That's what it feels like when you're lagging behind. Maybe you're slow to obey what God is showing you. You'll do it, but only when it really, really hurts. It's like, fine, I'll, I'll speed up. You see this with kids where it's like, go up to your room and clean it. And it's just like all of a sudden, slow motion. <laughs> I'm going to obey you, but I hate it. It's like, <laughs> and, and it's funny because it's sort of like, it's like all of a sudden you're, you're, you're actually specifically going 10 times slower now that I've given you some direction. And I think we do that with God. I think God says, hey, I want you to be more patient with your wife or hey, I want you to take this job that you really don't wanna take or hey, I want you to whatever, fill in the blank. He's guiding you, he's directing you, he's speaking to you or the word of God's really clear to you about something, or one of your brothers in Christ is like saying, hey, you need to look at this. You need to listen to me. Listen to me. I am your friend. And what do you do? You slow way down, and you're like, I know that's true. I know it's right, and I know I ought to do it. And all of a sudden, that, that yoke gets really heavy and painful that's what it feels like to lag behind God when you're trying to yoke up with him. Or maybe you're just unwilling to bear the weight of the life that God has given you. You want a different life. You know, it's kind of this idea of kind of like, you should bloom where you're planted, you know? It's sort of like, God has you where you are. You can't live your whole life thinking I'm going to when, and just waiting and waiting and waiting for this other life, and then I will take the initiative. Then I will listen to your leading. Then I will. The weight that you've been given, the life that you've been given, the burden that you have is not the same. We all have different things. That's why it's not a program. That's why it's not a formula. Because Jesus is coming alongside each of us with the load that we are called to bear. He's not asking us to do a certain thing. He's saying, come to me, right? So he goes on to say, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Doesn't that sound good? Jesus is a gentle, humble teacher. You know, there's a lot of different ideas about what God is like, you know, like maybe you feel like God is really distant and far away. You know, he loves you, he saved you, you'll see him when you die. Or maybe you feel like he's really, really up close and controlling. And every little thing is like, ah, 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 nope, don't do that. Don't, nope, yep, okay, yes, good job. Nope, you're doing it wrong. Like every decision is figuring out the perfect will of God. And that's exhausting, isn't it? The thought that God would be like that. I mean, think about how you are with your own children if you were that controlling, how terrible that kid would become when they get out of your house. That's not what God's like, right? Because if you believe that he is distant or if you believe that he's controlling or you believe that God is cruel, you're gonna be scared. You're gonna feel like a constant failure and you're gonna feel like you're alone every day. But here we have a totally different picture of who God is through Jesus. He says, I wanna be right next to you. Isn't that good news? I wanna be right next to you, helping you along and gently, humbly directing you. You're safe if you believe that. If you believe that God is good and gentle and patient, he's gonna come alongside you and he's gonna pull the weight. 
then you're gonna feel safe and you're gonna feel like, all right, God, let's figure this out. I've got a life. It's got its burdens. Help me with it. Invite him in to gently direct you. You're gonna feel safe. You're gonna feel like you and God are gonna figure this out together. You are gonna feel every single day of your life when you wake up in the morning that you are never alone, even if everyone in the world abandons you. You're never alone if you have a humble teacher that's right by your side. And then verse 28 through 30, it ends with verse 30 where he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's the part that just takes a little bit of faith to grab a hold of, doesn't it? You see, you might say, Jimmy, I don't, my yoke doesn't feel light. It doesn't feel, my yoke feels really heavy. And just going back to what we said before, it is heavy if you're lagging behind or pressing ahead of God. It's guaranteed to be heavy if you're gonna try to pull the weight by yourself, right? But Jesus is saying that if you will get in step with him, if you will step back, if you will walk with him, if you will let him carry some of that weight with you, that between the two of you, which it's amazing, he includes us, but between the two of you, yes, you're gonna have to pull some, right? But God is gonna be next to you and you're gonna be able to pull that weight together. That's what it's like. He says, my burden is light. And you might say, well, it doesn't feel like it's light, Jimmy. It feels heavy. I feel exhausted. I have to ask you the question, is it his yoke that you're carrying? Because he says his yoke is easy. There's a lot of yokes. Maybe you're pulling someone else's. Maybe you're pulling a weight that's not yours to pull at all. You can't pull the weight of your spouse. Give up. I mean that in a good way. You can bear burdens with one another. We can't, you can't pull burdens for one another. You can't pull someone else's life. Maybe you're pulling alone. You've never really invited God into the details of your personal life. Maybe you're trying to pull everything, but God's gonna cover the sin part. You're like, God, pull the biggest weight that I can't deal with, and that is sin. You cover sin, I'll do my life. And of course, that's gonna be heavy because you're pulling all by yourself a yoke that you were never meant to pull, that you can't pull. See, God wants to be in the actual details of your life, the actual things. Out of this room today, when you go out to the car and you go out to eat and you go do the things that you're gonna do, Jesus doesn't want to be in church. Jesus wants to be in your life, right? And he's dying to get into the details with you. Maybe you're feeling weary because you need to put down your yoke and you need to pick up his. Well, you're not alone in that. Every one of us needs to do that. True hope is found in Jesus as he comes alongside us daily to teach us how to live. If it's heavy, it's not Jesus' yoke. You say, but, but life is hard. And that's true. But his yoke is easy. So why do you think people shy away from this idea of the easy yoke? I think it's because it's too good. That sounds too good to be true. That really there's a way of living in Christ that all of a sudden makes the burdens of your life seem easy, that fills you with a kind of joy and hope and power that you can deal with things even if they're painful, even though it's difficult, even if everyone abandons you, that you can actually walk with Jesus in such a way that no matter what the burden is that you're carrying, it's gonna feel light. That's where people check out, I think. It's, it's too good. I know that's for me. It's hard for me to trust God and go, all right. 
But you ever felt that before? Have you ever felt like, man, I'm going through something really hard. It makes no sense. I don't know what to do, but you know what? Weird, it, I just feel this peace. I just have some strength. I didn't, I don't know where it's coming from. Well, that's, that's what it feels like to walk in the easy yoke. And it's easy to get ahead of him and it's definitely easy to get behind. So maybe you don't like the idea of it being easy because um, you aren't the hero if God pulls the weight. We kind of like to kind of go around and say, how are you doing? I'm tired, I'm really tired, I'm really busy, I'm really awesome. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> why is that? Because we want to be the hero of the story. Je Jesus is the hero, right, of the story. He wants to pull alongside of us. You know, maybe you don't like depending on God or anybody else for anything. Maybe you're like, all right, I, you know, God, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. But this idea of actually sharing the load, I don't like that idea. I, I don't like to share. I want to do it myself but it's what hope really looks like. It looks like walking with Jesus, learning from him, being taught by him, and finding your rest in his strength, no matter how weary you feel. So don't get ahead of him. Try to figure everything out. Try to put a formula together. Don't lag behind and try to pawn off your weight on someone else or pick up someone else's weight that you're not supposed to. Walk in step with Jesus. Start simply. And I just want to give you this encouragement. Start simply by getting alone with Jesus and just say, I want to lay down my yoke and I want to pick up yours. I can't carry my life. Help me take the next step. And the reason why it's not a formula is because I don't know what Jesus will say or where he will take you or how fast he's gonna go. Because it's personal for each person. So you have to get with him and you have to find out what the next instructions are. But if you take on his yoke, he will show you, he will help you, he will gently walk it out with you. So I'm gonna end with this. True hope is for the weary and the burdened. True hope is found in the person of Jesus, not a formula. True hope gives us rest for our souls. It's not a nap, it's not a vacation. It's a satisfying adventure with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. True hope is knowing that his gentle guidance will keep you on track. True hope is found in the easy yoke of Jesus. True hope is Jesus pulling alongside you. He can do more than you could ever do alone. Bottom line, true hope is found in Jesus. And Jesus is handing out hope this morning. Do you want some of it? So let's remember what we've learned in the series together. Hope is the joyous anticipation of good. The fuel of our faith, the anchor of our souls our strength in the midst of tragedy. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Hope is a life abounding that overwhelms our fears, overcomes our struggles, and overflows to those around us. If you wanna find rest for your soul, Jesus is right here next to you and wants to carry the weight. The weight that you can't carry on your own. Would you guys stand with me? Let's pray. Jesus is saying this to us this morning. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.